Thank you for joining the Business Extra. I'm Mustafa Al Rawi, the National's Assistant Editor in Chief here in Abu Dhabi. With me is Kelsey Warner, the National's Future Editor and the co host of the Business Extra. Hi, Kelsey. Hey, Mustafa. How are you? I'm well. Good. And today we're talking uh, robots. The latest and greatest in robots with a foremost expert globally on this on the subject. Excellent. So as Kelsey mentioned, we're going to talk to uh, Carnegie Mellon's head of robotics, Professor Takeo Kanadi, in a second. Uh, before we do that, uh, please do subscribe. And if you're on YouTube, ring that bell. Um, so introducing Professor Takeo Kanadi from Carnegie Mellon. How are you, Professor? How are you? Very good. Thank you for being with us. Um, I, I wonder if it's okay, can I ask a very, maybe it's a basic question, but I've always wanted to know this. Um, is robotics the same as AI and machine learning, or is it something different? Well, in one sense, robotics is a very big field. Uh, I would say robotics is the largest, AI is smaller, and then machine learning is even smaller. So machine learning is a technique to, or techniques, a set of techniques to make program uh, better or the capability of a program that can make it, it uh, make itself to be uh, smarter, to be better by learning from examples. So that's machine learning. AI is, as the name suggests, artificial intelligence. So uh, in the simplest way, it is the scientific and engineering field to make a computer um, intelligent. Now, intelligence itself is very difficult to define, but let's talk about, let's say, generally speaking, what we human think intelligent. Uh, so let's 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 uh, not going into the discussion of you know uh, technical definition of intelligence, but in that sense, what we think smart, intelligent. So in that sense, to make computers smart. Now robotics is the field that is the machinery, uh, including both mechanical as well as the software machinery. Now, when I say machinery, it doesn't mean it's only mechanical. It, it could be software too, but it is a system that will, uh, that uh, the, the system that is, that is intelligent and also can make effect to the physical world. So in that sense, robotics is the largest and inside of that is intelligent system that makes the robot smarter. Inside of that is a tech is a set of technique to make robots or AI systems even smarter by learning. So I think that's the definition of those three or explanation of those three things that you asked. They're nesting dolls. So in your work, you've worked on unmanned helicopters, you've worked on surgical robots. Um, as many as 30 years ago, you were actually part of a team that drove that piloted a driverless truck across the United States. And I just want to get a sense from you. Okay, you've been at this for decades now, and we've both been very afraid of the rise of the robots. They seem like they're coming at us fast and yet not quickly enough. So when you think about this field, where are we at? Where are our driverless cars? Where are our robot surgeons? Where are our unmanned helicopters? These are things you've been thinking about for such a long time. What are the hurdles? By the way, I've worked on this in this area for five decades, 50 years. <laughs> so half, century. half a century, right? Your, 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 driverless, your driverless car went across the U.S. 30 years ago, but you had been at it for two decades before that. That's right. So anyway, um, well, well, number one, I'm not afraid of robots or AI system. The smarter they are. Uh, the merrier, I think. Uh, why not? I think we we will get. Uh, we, I think they are useful devices, useful systems that make our uh, lives more convenient, more productive, and uh, in general, AI systems 
I think the biggest applications of AI system in the future is to make ourselves human even smarter. Um, so I think uh, driverless cars is only one area that uh, will, I think, uh, you know, accidents. Uh, we, and then in, if all the cars will be autom auto autonomously driven, then we won't have accidents. Don't you think that's a good thing to have? Is the issue right now with autonomous driving that there is still a human element that's part of it? I, I saw the U.S. issued a, the U.S. regulator issued kind of an accidents report over the last year of autonomous driving. And there was, I think, around 400 accidents, some of them fatal, having to do with autonomous drivers on the road in the United States. But it seems to be it's their interaction with human drivers and the introduction of human error that is still the gating issue with driverless vehicles. Is is that your belief or? I think, uh, well, I think uh, one can argue in many ways. My personal view is the current, uh, what is called level three, that is basically a uh, computer uh, drives most of the time. And when uh, some critical situations come out, uh, then human take over. That's called level three. Now, in my personal view, I think that's a wrong uh, scenario. I think, uh, imagine that uh, you're at the driver's seat and you're doing something else, and then all of a sudden you're asked to drive. Isn't that the most difficult thing? I would, I would actually say it would be much easier to drive yourself. And that's indeed one of my jokes when we uh, have done this autonomous driving uh, from Pittsburgh to West Coast. My joke is that, you know, uh, even though it's autonomous driving, um, it's funny to say it, but, <laughs> but you may not be completely believe in your program. So you're at the driver's seat and don't hold on Hold, hold the uh, you know steering uh, steering wheel, but when uh, something goes wrong, you hold it and then drive. And then I said, "Isn't it easier to drive yourself from the beginning?" So I think that's a level three is a failure. I think a scenario. My personal view. Level four and five are intended to be completely autonomous. So. Once we get there, and we, we will, then it would be much easier, much better, and the program will be a safer driver than human being. And it, I, I'm 100% sure it will be that way. I have to add, if all the cars are driven autonomously, then we can, the, each car, all the cars can communicate. So one car knows what other car will, what other cars will do. That is not a situation we have when humans are driving, right? We don't know what other car will do, and we have to prepare for that. And that is indeed the most difficult thing, and probably that is one of the reasons that we have so many accidents. And I have a joke that uh, you know. In Boston, where the traffic is very tough, I heard the no. The best thing to do is just look straight and never look at any other car's driver. Once you see other car's driver, and if you <laughs> see other car's driver's eye, that is telling the other car's driver you recognize him or her, and it you will avoid <laughs> that car. So it's better off not to look at anything else, but just straight. Then other car will <laughs> steer clear. Will give you, yeah, will clear the way for you. Driving in Boston sounds fun, but um, but while we talk about it, it raises an important point, which is about the particular aspects of any city or country or geography. And we're here in Abu Dhabi in the UAE. Our environment is very different from, say, parts of the US or Europe. Our weather is different, heat levels different, 
dust, sand, you name it, that we might have. How much of that will impact the spread of, 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 of autonomous cars that they need to be tested in specific environments in which they will operate to, the, to be 100% safe? Well, I, uh, I think... Uh, I think in weather, I mean, uh, I, I was like, uh, when I was in Abu Dhabi, I was very impressed. You know, the tra- the, the roads are so beautifully maintained, uh, well lit, and four or five rains, and, uh, uh, and then traffic is not as dense as other cities I, I was. And so, in general, I think uh, Abu Dhabi is probably as a good city for autonomous driving, even uh, even today. Now, these things, uh, the things like a uh, situation like sand and so forth, they are tough in general, not just even for ta- autonomous driving, uh, for uh, any mechanical systems. I heard uh, one of my friends in automobile companies told me that uh, when they brought cars from, uh, say, uh, my friend is a Japanese automaker's friend. He said uh, from uh, <clears throat> Japan to um, UAE or other uh, countries in uh, the you know uh, Middle East, then the sand is definitely uh, the difficulty to make sure the you know, car is cars are uh, in good conditions. You see, you see, so you know, as a as a as far as I uh, I haven't experienced a sandstorm. It may be terrible, but in in general, a light sand that I saw. Those are probably not that difficult situations. So you were in Abu Dhabi recently, actually teaching a course, uh, you were a guest lecturer at MBZ UAI, the AI University in Abu Dhabi, and you were speaking to a room full of business leaders, executives in the UAE who are, you know, learning about AI and its applications and kind of in your capacity as somebody who's bringing research from the ivory tower and thinking about what its commercial applications might be, wondering what message do you want to impart to business leaders these days? What are the important messages to get across about AI and robotics potential? Where are the untapped business opportunities? I think my message was that uh, AI has enormous opportunities. I just talked, uh, my main topic was computer vision, how to make computers uh, be able to see, just like human. And uh, I think, uh, I I hope I could convince participants, there are a lot of opportunities for computer vision. Why? Because number one, uh, I, uh, the sensors, cameras, they are ubiquitous now. We, we see almost everywhere. I, I call it cried out, crowd eyes situation. You, you understand? The eyes are computer cameras are everywhere. Uh, if you look at the, your cell phone, Cell phone has three or four cameras. Each car now has sometimes 10 or more camera cameras that look around and so forth. Number two, I think computers are getting uh, cheaper, faster, and also uh, the, the uh, energy, uh, I mean, the, the uh, power, uh, low power computer is everywhere. And also the AI in general, and in particular learning uh, algorithms in, in advancing, that makes the uh, development of program uh, a lot easier. So the combination of these three, I call it actually a perfect storm scenario, situation of computer vision, and uh, including superhuman computer vision capability I think uh, I think uh, there there are the enormous applications uh, in every segment of our society, from our daily life to manufacturing to uh, space and other uh, explorations. Uh, I want I wanted to talk a little bit about um, 
you know, the the future of a world with robotics that is sort of everywhere. And it's exciting. And I think philosophically, I can see how the more robots we have, the the better the future could be, the better of quality of life. But also, I, I don't know in terms of exclusivity and inclusivity when it comes to robotics. And of course, a lot of the developments are in, in, in the biggest economies, whether it's the US or elsewhere. And I know other countries like the UAE are trying to, to invest more in, in, in robotics. But will that future be one for everybody? Will, will you know, lesser developed economies, lower income countries, will they be able to adopt robots uh, on a large scale? Is it something that will be cheap enough for everyone? But also kind of, it, it also says to me, and, and obviously this is more an economist's um, area of expertise than yours, Professor, but it, it just, in my mind, if all the jobs are taken by the robots, then suddenly those people doing those jobs, when they, they go back to their countries, for example, if they are migrant workers, have to then have a completely different career. Shouldn't robotics be part of a wider shift? Shouldn't we all be looking at this together? Economists, uh, leaders, uh, CEOs as well as experts like you? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a good idea. Um, the as you said, impact of AI and robotics is huge, and uh, it's unquestionable that many jobs uh, that are being done today by human will be replaced by robots. Now, I think it's, it's our, our means, a human society as a whole, or community as a whole, or economist, or eventually, I think, politics, uh, re, uh, responsibility, how to take advantage of that for making our society better. I think, uh, the robotics or AI itself is not evil. Uh, it can never be. Um, I think uh, it it is our. It should be our responsibility, our intelligence, how to make good use of uh, those technologies. And I think uh, there there should be there should be. By the way, by the way, I I don't believe that all the jobs will be taken. Now, if so what's wrong about it then uh, all of us uh, don't need to uh, i think this will be doing something interesting and uh, something productive while not being worried about uh, you know uh, risking uh, or even our lives for uh, doing uh, various necessary jobs so i think uh, robotics itself will never be will never be a bad, uh, bad thing. I, I, as a technologist, I have a firm belief of that. I'm, I'm worried it'll just result in us endlessly scrolling. Um, but I think, to your point, though, when you were named, in 2016, you were given the Kyoto Prize as a laureate for advanced technology. And in your speech, you said you advised people to do good research. You need to think like an amateur, but do as an expert. In a field as complicated as yours, what does it mean to think like an amateur in the field of robotics? Well, think like an amateur is, uh, it, it, that doesn't mean that you have to be amateur. What I meant is when you do, when you're an uh, expert, researchers must be expert, by the way. And uh, if you're, by the way, uh, in any profession, in order to do good things, you have to be expert. That's given. However, experts are experts. Why? Because they are they learn what to do in a particular given situation. Right? That's why we are, the people are called expert and that's why they're paid. However, that usual that at the same time and most of the time by the way they are correct. That's why they are paid. However, the fact that they are doing the right thing given a situation right now, right is the traditional wisdom. 
I think uh, in one sense that limits already scope of your thinking. In order to get out of it, sometimes you have to doubt about the common, common sense in the sense of expert. Yeah, that's what I meant. Think like an amateur. In other words, temporarily, you don't expect or you don't assume the previous methods, previous uh, common sense way of dealing things as a, as a, as a granted. Instead, think broader, think a new direction. That's what I meant, think like an amateur. And I think that is always the case by even, by the way, politics uh, or uh, the, the, the people who, uh, executives, business, and so forth. However, good ideas can never be realized without properly being implemented. For that purpose, you have to be expert. You have to have a skill. And skilled people can always do better job than non-skilled people. That's for sure. That's what I meant. Think like an amateur, do as an expert. I'm sure you're familiar with the Blade Runner, the, the, the film from the 1980s about AI and robots. And it, in that movie, they envisaged one company making all the robots. Now, I look at big tech now, and we have Google and Apple, and we have a handful of companies dominating technology. Do you think that in the future, it will be like that when it comes to robotics? It will be a handful, if not one single company, dominating robotics? Well, in the past, when I, when I at least, uh, well, of course, I'm not an economist, and I'm not a futurist, and I'm not a historian. So uh, don't take uh, what I say as, uh, you know, the correct or, uh, but, I, but I think it's a human nature that when some good idea exists and other people will learn from it, and then uh, quite often latecomer can be sometimes better. And I think that that's been that way for almost all industry, for almost anything. And uh, I think that's a human nature. And I, I don't think that robotics and AI can be a special case that only one company or only one person can dominate. And I don't believe that. I think we there are enough smart people, enough active people, enough, uh, you know, uh, the uh, skillful people who can succeed. And I wanted to ask you, I don't know if you have a favorite film or book when it comes to robots, but is there any, anything that you've, you've seen that you like in particular? Well, I, uh, now I actually like, uh, when I was a boy, uh, in Japan, there was, uh, uh, the comic story called, uh, Atom Boy, and then that's a robot. Uh, it's always, he is uh, always, uh, well, he's a boy, but he, he is a, he's a good person. And I, I, I believe that robot will be, now, there might be a bad robot too. And even in that uh, movie, there were bad robots, but don't worry, there are good robots too. Just like there are bad people, but good people are too. So I think uh, overall, I, I'm uh, more optimistic about that. About uh, so, so, I don't know whether I answered your question or not. All right. Well, a mix a mixed message for the future of the robots from you, and hopefully the the good prevailing over evil. I want to ask you as a just a last question from me is. From your perch at Carnegie Mellon, working with the next generation of computer scientists and experts in your field, what are what is the next generation thinking about? What are they prioritizing? What is on the bleeding edge of what you're working on right now? So in computer vision area, beyond making the ordinary recognition like human can do, recognize object and uh, 
understand pictures together with the language and so forth. So making those capabilities better and better will happen. No question. At the same time, I think the field is moving toward uh, area where vision, visual capabilities of human can never, could never do. For example, looking inside the body. Now we have a good uh, last century MRI, magnetic re resonance imaging, CAT, uh, computer-aided uh, tomography, those are the capability to look, in, look inside the body. Now, a human could not. And then the reason that those devices were uh, the reason why the medicine was so advanced. Uh, likewise, I think uh, other capabilities, looking uh, beyond object, uh, looking a dark, uh, you know, uh, further inside uh, activities and, and so forth. So I, I generally call it superhuman capabilities. And I think that that will make our lives much better, much easier. Professor Kanadi, thank you so much for being with us. It was a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. Well, that's it for today. Kelsey Warner, thank you. It was fun. Thank you. All that remains to thank our production team and you all for being with us. Do join us again next time.